All right, RebelEM YouTube followers. So today we're gonna to go over a case of a ticking time bomb. So a 52 year old female, past medical history of type two diabetes mellitus and tobacco abuse presents to the emergency department for chest pain. So in terms of talking with her, it sounds like she's been having this stuttering chest pain that's been going on for the last two to three months that is worsened with activity and better with rest. So already a concerning story and some risk factors. Today she was working out in her garden and she developed chest pain um, that was not resolving. And so she actually drove herself into the emergency department with active chest pain. In terms of her initial vital signs, so she was normotensive with a blood pressure of 127 over 89, heart rate of 76, breathing 20 times a minute, satting 100% on two liters nasal cannula and a temp of 99.3. Just looking at the patient, she appeared to be kind of an extremis. I mean, she looked like she was not feeling comfortable kind of doing that classic Levine sign, um, grasping at her chest almost starting to get that sweat on her brow looking kind of diaphoretic. So with that, we went ahead and did an EKG and this is what we got. And my initial thoughts in looking at this was that this is a case of Wellens syndrome. But after thinking about it a little bit longer and really just kind of inspecting those leads, V1, 2, 3, and 4 a little bit closer, uh, I kind of came to a slightly different conclusion. So first of all, the rate's about 68. There's a normal sinus rhythm there. The axis is normal. She's obviously got uh, LVH, just looking at the amplitude of her QRS. And then when I look at her ST and T waves in leads V1 through V4, it looks like she's kind of got this biphasic T wave, which is what initially caught my attention and made me think Wellens. But if you look a little bit closer, she's got ST elevation in V1 to V3, and I don't really see any R waves. So there's just really no R wave progression with this EKG. So we went ahead and activated this as an occlusion myocardial infarction, um, and cardiology actually agreed with the patient having active symptoms and looking diaphoretic with the elevations. They went ahead and took her to the cath lab, and they ended up finding a proximal LAD lesion. Um, 100%. And she ended up getting a stent placed there and ended up having a very good outcome. Of note, her initial troponin was only 30. So even though she had been having several hours of chest pain, she only had mild elevation in her troponin. Um, so this was a completely clinical diagnosis based on the EKG and the patient presentation. So I do want to talk a little bit about Wellens syndrome, even though this ended up not being a case of it. I'm sure if she would have come in a month or two before, we probably would have seen those uh, biphasic T waves on her EKG. Um, and without active symptoms, we probably would have said this is a Wellens syndrome. So typically it's defined as having a history of angina, which in this case we were having active pain, T wave inversions or biphasic T waves in precordial leads. Uh, minimally elevated cardiac enzymes, which she also had. No pathologic precordial Q waves, which I didn't see any of those on this EKG. And then no loss of precordial R wave progression, which she actually had. Now, I got to tell you, when I was a student and people talked about poor R wave progression, I never really quite wrapped my brain around that or understood what that meant. And I found this infographic online that I thought did a really nice job of this. So if you look at the precordial leads from V1 to V6 on this image on the left, what you can see is that by the time you get to lead V3, your R wave and your S wave should be isoelectric. In other words, you're starting to kind of converge and then by V4, you see that your R wave is bigger than your S wave. And that's a normal R wave progression. With abnormal R wave progression, you just don't get to that isoelectric uh, R to S wave by V3. And as a matter of fact, you kind of have this kind of roller coaster type shape of your R waves as you go across. And that is considered poor R wave progression. And so here you can see there's just, there's no R waves. I mean, she's just got a Q, but it goes right into an ST elevation when you look at V2 and you look at V3. Now there's two types of Wellens. There's type A and type B. I think the whether it's a type A or type B matters less than just recognizing the pattern. Typically the biphasic pattern is the pattern A and then the deep symmetric T wave is the pattern B. 
but both of these have been identified in the literature as a concern for a proximal LAD occlusion. And that's why this actually matters is because it signifies a high-grade proximal LAD stenosis. There are other things that can cause T-wave inversions in the anterior leads, and here I just have some examples of patients that I've seen in the past. The first EKG, there are kind of biphasic T-waves. This is a patient that had a massive pulmonary embolism. In the second EKG, you can see that there's these deep symmetric kind of T-waves, and this is a patient that ended up having um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then the last strip ended up being a patient that had a massive subarachnoid hemorrhage. And so you can get intracranial hemorrhages causing these kind of EKG patterns in those precordial leads as well. So what's the treatment for these? So, well, in addition to oxygen, um, nitroglycerin, aspirin, all the things, um, Lovenox or uh, heparin, the question is, is do they need to go to the cath lab sooner or later. In this case, she was having active pain and ST elevation, so we went in and activated it as an occlusion myocardial infarction. But a lot of these patients will present and not be having active symptoms. And for those patients, the question is, what should we do? And this is an, a much, much, much older study back from March of 1989 in the American Heart Journal that showed that by getting patients admitted and getting to the cath lab sooner, so I'm not talking about heart alert activation, but not sitting on them for two or three days, just getting them to the cath lab sooner, um, lowered their mortality, and they were less likely to have an acute myocardial infarction. And so these people need kind of semi-urgent revascularization or left heart catheterization for revascularization because you have to uh, kind of put a stent in that thing before it clots off or they have a plaque rupture. So the take-home messages uh, are that if you recognize this biphasic T-wave pattern or deep symmetric T-wave pattern in the precordial leads, in the correct clinical setting, that signifies a high-grade proximal LAD lesion. There are other causes of T-wave abnormalities in the precordial waves, and the list is really long. I just gave you an example of three other diagnoses that can actually do this. And then the treatment of choice to improve morbidity and mortality is early revascularization. So not in the patient that we had that was having the active symptoms, but in a patient that presents and kind of gives you this stuttering pain history and has this finding on their EKG, that's not a patient that you want to send home or a patient that you want to sit on too long. So there you have it, a ticking time bomb. Let me know your thoughts, comments, and questions. Thank you as always for tuning in and until next time.